There are moments in time when the world changes. It's seven o'clock, it's June the 15th, 1920. And Arthur Burroughs steps to the microphone and he knows on his shoulders the future of broadcasting is on his shoulders. I mean, that must have been an incredible period, incredible moment. It's 10 past seven in the evening. He walks to the microphone and says, hello, CQ. Tonight, Madame Melbourne will perform. She walks to the microphone. It's still the same microphone Winifred Sayer had used. It's still just a telephone set, just the, the transmit set. It's hanging on a coat hook by a piece of elastic. It's got a cone made of a cigar box. It's still smelled of cigars. She has to hold it arm's length and she sings towards it. They have no idea whether they can transmit her voice. They'd not had any tests. She'd run up a scale just to say, and the valve just overloaded. So they had to make her stand back because she sang so loud. And the great lady walks to the microphone and she starts to sing. And her voice is heard across the world. They even hear it in Australia, they hear it in Iraq, they hear it in France and Austria and Finland and all the boat operators. It's like the whole world clamps their headphones closer and they tickle their cat's whisker receivers. And you can't really now explain to people how magical this was. Music from the skies, voices from the heavens, these were the phrases that were being used. Suddenly, for the first time in your front room, words and music and a world-class entertainer is coming out the came out the headphones coming out the speakers and also you mark the change now it's a it's a massive change in social history for a thousand years if not more the fireplace had always been the focus of the family they sat around the fire at night from then on in it's going to be the radio this is the start it starts in june 1920 and it starts in chelmsford the marconi new street works I now, as a historian, I've been looking at this for 30 years. It is just an incredible time. She sings, she sings three arias. After, as the third, halfway through the third song, the transmitter fails. Transmitter explodes. Um, the, the output valve, the MT4, get this go. Uh, she keeps singing, she doesn't know. The engineer is going to straight panic. The valves are red hot. They pull it out with pliers. They plug a new valve and they power it up. Melba stops because she realizes something's wrong. Burroughs runs in and just says, Madam Melba, it is amazing. The world is calling for more. Are they really? Shall I carry on singing? Yes, he said. She repeated the song they'd lost. She repeats two more. She's about to finish. And Burroughs goes, something patriotic. So she sings, Home Sweet Home, and then God Save the Queen, the first stanza. Burroughs steps to the microphone and said, Hello, C. Clue, this is... Station MZX Chelmsford closing down. Madame Elba has sung. Click. It causes a storm across the world. They record it in Paris on wax discs and aluminium discs. They put speakers in the Champs Elysees and people are dancing to Melba. It becomes a true first in the history of radio. It is very quickly followed by two more concerts. Lawrence Melchior comes, hugely popular and famous Danish tenor, and, and Dame Clara Butt. Probably even at more of a height of her career than Melba was Clara Butt. She was 30-something, Melba was 60-something. She's the new young upstart. She has to come and sing for radio. They're amazing concerts. They cause this massive bust. You're talking, how many listeners? Some people say 50,000, some people say 200,000. You don't know because there's no licensing. But everybody who could listens in. I also think it's fairly reassuring to most modern broadcasters that even the biggest radio broadcast around the world had its fair share of technical issues with engineers and producers running in to save the day. Well, there was even one before. The engineers always save the day. Oh, I'm an engineer by trade. Right at the beginning of the concert, before she even started, one of the engineers saw a flash gun where the old flash bulbs go off, shut the whole transmitter down. It had to be warmed up again, which is why it didn't start at 7 o'clock. It had to start at 7.10 because it took time to sew it all up because they panicked and thought a valve would blow. It later did. It is an embryonic technology. This is, there's only one of these in the world. It's the world's, probably the world's biggest, it is, would have been the world's biggest speech, right? 15,000 watts. We think that BBC Essex at the moment is using probably 400 watts, 15,000 watts. Their aerial is small. These are 450 watt mass. This is a massive signal, but that was the problem. Radio was always well established. There was the birth of civilian air traffic control, marine stations, commercial, military, uh, time stations. When Chelmsford was on air, nothing else worked. The Chelmsford station flattened every radio station in Northern Europe. It was so huge and such a wide, messy signal, because um, the val <laughs> there was no such thing as tuning in those days, you just transmitted. It was on all bands, harmonics everywhere were enormous. 
Um, the interference was spectacular. By the time they had three concerts, the military was starting to complain immensely. Croydon Air Traffic Control reported that during Melbourne's concert, a de Havilland DH-6 with 28 souls on board on the first commercial aviation, this is the birth of civil aviation, was en route, was desperately trying to get direction and landing information from uh, the radio station at Lymph, and all they could hear was a pleasant musical soiree from Chelmsford. In November 1920, the Postmaster General, the Right Honourable F.G. Kellaway MP, said it had to stop, and for the time there'd be no more experimental licences granted to Chelmsford. And it shut down. It was the end of broadcast, the end of experimental, end of 1920. The Marconi Company didn't bat an eyelid. They simply packed all the equipment up and they carried on changing the transmitters, trying to actually get the frequency locked, trying to stop it drifting, trying to get the valves more reliable, just again as pure blue sky experimental research. Nobody knew what was going on. And the airways lapped into silence. In 1921, all you could hear was monotonous Morse code of military, commercial, marine traffic, the radio amateurs, the dear old hams, remember Tony Hancock, that's a whole armful. Well, they'd come into the fore, they'd already started to form societies, 63 radio societies would become the Radio Society of Great Britain. They lobbied, petitioned, and generally made Kellaway's life a nightmare. They wanted radio broadcast, they wanted it now. In January 1922, they basically said, OK, they'll relent and allow one scheduled, advertised radio station to come online. They went to the Marconi company and said, please do it. And they went, no. <laughs> Everything's gone back to Ireland. We're not really interested. But Burroughs picked it up and went, actually, out at, in the small village of Rittle, about two and a half miles outside Chelmsford, uh, we have a small team of maverick engineers run by Peter Eckersley. They're the airborne wireless development team. Direct descended from the Royal Flying Corps Royal Air team that developed speech radio and they've carried on building the radio for air traffic control and direction finding and weather information and traffic information. They're really busy. By 1922 those engineers Eckersley, Kirk, Wynne, Ashbridge probably knew more about speech radio than anybody else in the world. The license was granted to the Marconis with less than two weeks' notice, this sounds familiar, Arthur Burroughs walks into Peter Eckersley's hut. They haven't even got mains electricity, it's just a generator. There is no toilet there. It's up to a horn speaker. They get up to the pub for anything else. One stove heating the hut and said, Peter, we want you to do this thing called broadcasting. Eckersley smoked his pipe and looked at him and went, are you mad? That's Chelmsford's job. No, Chelmsford can't do it. It's up to you. And he goes, what is it? What do you want? And Burroughs went, we don't know. Make it up. But for a time, we've got a wind-up ground phone from the Chapel Wireless Company. I'm going to select a bunch of records. All you have to do is introduce them, play them, shut down every three minutes in case you're interfering with legitimate sources. Don't transmit with more than 400 watts into your little area outside, 110-foot high masts, ex bore war. One night a week, after hours, you don't get any extra pay. Any equipment you use has to be returned to normal use. And any expenses if you want to bring a singer in has to be paid out of your own pocket. Exy said, and this is a good deal. <laughs> and that is the birth of British broadcasting. In a little hut in a partly flooded field in the little village of Rittle. Its call sign, which was just another amateur radio call sign, another professional radio call sign, was 2MT. Today we call it 2 Mike Tango, but Eckersley was X Flying Corps, and they used a different phonetic alphabet. So in their language, it was 2 Emmatoc. On St. Valentine's Day night, 14th of February 1922, a weak, static-laden voice echoed out from the Rittle hut, and it was, Hello CQ, this is Tuematok Rittle testing, this is Tuematok Rittle calling. And the world changes. Hello CQ, hello CQ. This is two Emma Talk Rittle testing. This is two Emma Talk Rittle testing. Hello, CQ. Hello. Hello, Ash. Hello, Ash. Ash, hello. Are the signals OK? No, they're not. Wave your hand if it's all OK. No waves? No waves at all. Curse. Kirk, is that all right in there? Kirk! No, not? Sorry, sorry. Well, sorry, CQ. Closing down a moment. Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. This is two Emma Talk Rittle testing. This is two Emma Talk Rittle testing. Tonight, we have a most marvellous thing that's going to happen. We are going to receive Rome, that famous Italian tenor, 
that famous Italian tenor, what's his name? Gridlico is going to sing Non Puto Ferrore Pantissimo, which being translated means um, it's very difficult. CQ, the concert's ended. Sad wails the heterodyne. You must soon switch off your valves. I must soon switch off mine. Now we're going to receive it. There may be some atmospherics. There may be some... There may be some jamming. Pah, 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 pah. There may be some oscillation. Whew! But hang on, CQ. We're just going to receive it now. Hang on, CQ. Hang on, CQ. Here it is. Nie ma problemu. Nie ma problemu. 